Hi everybody, today we're going to go over antifungals and a couple other things. Nothing too crazy complicated in this lecture and I'll really point out what I need you to know for the exam. When you get into some of this it's a little bit specialized so again I don't want to spend a ton of time on some of these because they just aren't as commonly used as for example antibiotics. I know we're going over this information next week, but this is an example of how I might ask a test question. So you can go back to this uh, throughout your studying, and I'll give you some more cases too. But um, the cases I'll give you are more open-ended, think about it type responses, whereas this is more of an actual example of how I might ask a question. So we have a 52-year-old man, past medical history, significant for hypertension, diabetes, MI three years ago, prevents to urgent care with productive cough, fever, malaise. Chest x-ray indicates left lower lobe pneumonia. He's healthy enough to be discharged. However, you'd like to give him one dose of a medication IV now and something to take orally at home. Which option is most appropriate? Give you a second to think about that if you want to pause and look up some stuff or read some guidelines or whatever you might want to do. So I'll go through the answers here. There's a couple things to consider when uh, discussing community-acquired pneumonia. Remember, you really need to cover two things primarily, and that's going to be streptococcus pneumoniae and atypical pathogens like mycoplasma, uh, chlamydia pneumoniae, and um, legionella would be the other one. Though there's a few drugs on here that do that and some combinations that don't. So choice A is levofloxacin IV plus one dose, or times one dose, plus levofloxacin PO. This is actually the correct choice. So we want to make sure that we're covering everything, and that's what a fluoroquinolone would do. And you always want to do, for community-acquired pneumonia, you can use either levofloxacin or moxifloxacin. The only one you can't use is Cipro. It's just not considered a respiratory fluoroquinolone, and I, I just don't think it penetrates the pulmonary area as well as the other ones, as from my understanding. And its coverage of strep pneumo might not be as advantageous compared to the other ones. Choice B is ceftriaxone IV times one dose plus azithromycin PO. This might sound fine initially, however the problem is you aren't covering strep pneumo on the outpatient side. So if you give somebody an IV dose of ceftriaxone and start them on azithromycin, you still need to continue some form of third generation cephalosporin or second generation cephalosporin to make sure you're covering that strep pneumo. Remember that azithromycin and macrolides only have, uh, have pretty poor coverage against um, strep pneumo, which is why we can't use them as single therapy in a community-acquired pneumonia case. Choice C is doxycycline, one dose plus doxycycline PO. This would be okay if I didn't give you any medical history. So if I said he's a 52-year-old man who's relatively healthy, doxycycline might be a fine option for him. Um, but guidelines would point you to somebody who has a more complicated past medical history, including cardiovascular issues, diabetes, things like that. You'd want to lean more towards aggressive therapy, which puts you back at the fluoroquinolone. So remember, doxycycline is not a bad option. Just think about healthy patients and that. It does cover strep pneumo pretty well, not quite as well as fluoroquinolones. I mean, you're talking about doxycycline maybe having 90% coverage, um, fluoroquinolones probably having 95 to 98% coverage. Again, small difference, but uh, could be significant in a, in a less healthy patient. Finally, D is uh, Zosin or Piperacillin Tazobactam plus Augmentin PO. This is inappropriate for a number of reasons. First of all, you wouldn't just give somebody a dose of Zosin and then send them home on something else. I mean, if you're going to give somebody Zosin, they're probably going to be coming into the hospital for a more serious infection. So you might say, well, what about Unison? Because that's kind of similar to Augmentin when we're talking about um, IV to PO therapy. But the problem is, is that you're missing your atypical coverage at this point. So you could do, you could scrap this first part and just say give them Augmentin plus azithromycin and that actually would be appropriate for community acquired pneumonia. Okay, next case. This is a 74 year old woman. She is obese, has diabetes without with significant complications including amputation of her left great toe two years ago. Her diabetes is poorly controlled, and today she has been admitted to your inpatient unit due to fevers and a new deep necrotic ulcer on the sole of her right foot. Not having any recent culture data, what antibiotic strategy is best to start at this time? I'll give you a few seconds to think about this. We're looking at a diabetic foot ulcer. So diabetic foot ulcers, one thing to remember for sure is that you're looking at a complicated microbial colonization probably. So you usually have a number of different possible pathogens. 
And when you treat a diabetic foot ulcer, they're usually pretty deep. Um, deep uh, ulcerations usually lead to more complicated uh, therapy due to need to cover multiple different types of pathogens. So when we're talking about a, a foot ulcer, we're looking at complicated um, gram positives, gram negatives, and anaerobic bacteria. So you want to cover broad spectrum. Usually we're going to do something like vancomycin plus something that covers all the other things. So I've given you a couple options here. A would be inappropriate for most patients. Now, it might be debatable whether or not you need vancomycin, but empirically, until you know the person doesn't have MRSA, probably would want to cover it just to make sure you're, you're, you're good until your culture comes back and tells you otherwise that you don't need the vancomycin. And again, that's maybe a couple of days to get that information. So B would be vancomycin alone, which again, unless you knew you're dealing with MRSA specifically or you're covering staph aureus and the patient was allergic to other things, uh, that just doesn't make sense right off the bat. You'd really need culture data. And here I specifically told you, you don't have any recent culture data. So again, think about empiric therapy and what the best starting point would be for this patient, not really having a lot of information. C is vancomycin plus piperacillin tazobactam. This would be the correct option. And that's going to cover gram negatives, gram positives uh, with Vanco, including MRSA. And also it's going to pick up your anaerobes. Choice D might seem good as well, but remember cefepime doesn't have great anaerobic coverage. So if you have some bacteroides living in that deep ulceration, it's not going to pick that up. So that's why Zosin has the advantage there. Um, if you added something onto cefepime like metronidazole, that would be an okay choice too. But here I just gave you cefepime. All right, moving on to antifungals. Antifungals range from somewhat commonly used to incredibly rare, and I'm going to really gloss over some of the rare antifungals and, and not test you on them substantially. I'll tell you what I think you need to know out of the group. Think about antifungals. The more broad spectrum you go, you're usually looking at really sick immunocompromised patients. Fungal infections are pretty opportunistic, meaning that they take advantage of people with weakened immune systems or really sick people. So sometimes if you if you work as a, uh, in an intensivist service, like in an ICU, you might see a little bit more antifungal use than, for example, if you work med surge, if you work outpatient primary care, you're pretty much going to use fluconazole and anything more than that would be unusual. So we'll go through some of this. And again, I'm going to gloss over some of it because it just really isn't that commonly used in the grand scheme of things, especially to talk about more of a general approach. All right, uh, infection risk. Again, I talked about this a little bit already, but most patients are really only going to experience mild fungal infections, if anything. And the populations that are at risk for more severe fungal infections are those immunocompromised patients. So HIV, cancer, organ transplant, bone marrow transplant. Uh, most Fungi are opportunistic. So again, a lot of fungi are present in our environment. We have them on our skin. We have them in our body. We have them in our GI tract, but they usually don't have any pathogenic properties because if they do start to overgrow or get out of control or whatever it might be, our, our immune systems can handle them pretty easily. Um, broad spectrum antibiotic use, again, especially for like a critically ill patient. So if somebody's been in the ICU for a while, they're septic, they're on some kind of a broad spectrum regimen like the vanco zosin combo. This is somebody who's at high risk for getting some kind of a nosocomial fungal pathogen comorbid infection. And it doesn't necessarily, you don't necessarily have to be in a crit on ICU. I mean, you could be in an ICU because of one of these things too. So let's say you have leukemia and you get aspergillus and you come in into an ICU. So sometimes it's hard to identify a fungal source right away. Uh, they might start somebody because somebody comes in looking septic and we usually don't start fungal, antifungals empirically on people. So from a emergency department's um, practicing point of view, somebody came in really sick just because they're immunocompromised. Usually we won't start fungals. Every once in a while I have a provider who's like, I want to start an antifungal just to be sure. Usually I recommend they consult ID on that just to make sure that we're following the appropriate treatment guidelines as far as what to start. There's not a lot to say that if somebody comes in looking septic, because the odds of it being a fungal infection, it's still pretty low even in these populations. I mean, if it was an HIV person with virtually no CD4 count and a really high viral load, that might be different. But again, you might not know that right away. That might take time to get those labs back. So again, it's difficult to say, oh, yep, this is a fungal infection right off the bat. Usually we're going to have to do some ruling out 
a patient gets broad spectrum antibiotics and they're improving after 24 hours, that's probably a, a good sign that there might be something else going on, viral or fungal, whatever it might be. Uh, fungal infections can be really challenging to treat and even with appropriate therapy uh, can be quite deadly, high mortality rates. If you do get somebody on a, a regimen of an antifungal, sometimes it can be months of therapy too, to really make sure it's clear, especially pulmonary infections with, fung with fungal pathogens because they tend to clump up or form um, hard to get in inoculated areas within the lungs. Just difficult to penetrate that with antifungal agents. Okay, so uh, fungi are different than bacteria. That's all I really want to care about here, some background in case you want to know anything more. Here's some of the more common pathogenic organisms we might see. And most of the time with fungal infections, you're looking at a couple areas of the body that are going to be most significantly targeted. So pulmonary infections and central nervous system infections. And you might see other things too, like a bacteremia, but usually that bacteremia is comorbid with a, a, a pneumonia or some sort of meningitis type looking picture. So candida, candida species are the common ones we think of when it comes to fungal infections. So thrush, uh, vaginal yeast infections, um, they certainly can be disseminated too. And there's a lot of different candida species out there. Um, candida, well, we'll get to them in a second, so I won't talk about them right now. Um, blastomycosis uh, can cause pneumonia. Histoplasma can cause a tuberculosis-like pneumonia. Aspergillus, another pneumonia, possibly, excuse me, more disseminated than that too. Um, crypto cryptococcus is associated with uh, CNS infections, simply fungal meningitis. So just to show you what we're looking at, these are the more, again, the more common groups of organisms you would see as pathogens. This slide shows you the different drugs we use, their mechanisms of action, and how the drugs are classified. So for example, azole antifungals, here's what would be considered there. You can see amphotericin B isn't an azole fungal, but it has kind of a similar mechanism. These drugs, uh, echinocandins, have a different mechanism of action where they target the cell wall versus the cell membrane. Intracellular drugs too, uh, these aren't very common at all. Generally speaking, we're looking at uh, echinocandins, ampho B, and azole antifungals kind of as our most common broad spectrum. Um, other things like terbinafine is more of a topical agent, so you can apply that topically for things like athlete's foot. And Flu, cytosine, I'm not going to talk about that one a ton. It's not a more, it's a less commonly used product. Griseofulvin is uh, a slightly less common one too. There's some pediatric specific indications for it. And again, I'm not going to go through it because it's just, it gets a little too specialized for our, for our topic discussion here. All right, again, we're getting into the weeds on some of this. Um, you probably won't see amphotericin B prescribed or used a lot in your career. It's got a lot of interesting history be behind it. It's, it was one of the most broad spectrum IV antifungal agents we had for quite a while. Problem is, in its original forms, it's quite toxic. So it does have broad spectrum coverage. It covers a number of different fungal species and clinically useful for cryptococcal meningitis and other systemic fungal infections. Basically, you try something else, but ampho might be an option for somebody who's really sick and not improving to other newer drugs. Again, toxicity was a big deal with this drug when it first came out. Renally toxic, uh, and in its standard form, it's, it's going to cause renal toxicity. It just doesn't matter if your kidneys are healthy or not. It's pretty reversible, though, unless you give really high doses over extended periods of time, or combined with things like diuresis. So if you're fluid um, or decreasing the patient's volume status, causing dehydration with diuresis, that could be a comorbid issue that's gonna compound the kidney failure. Some other things here, there's a new, some other things I listed here I'm not as concerned about. Renal toxicity and amphobia is really the, the big take home with it that I would remember about the drug. There is a newer formulation on the market. There's some liposomal formulations that appear to be much better tolerated. They just kind of modified how the drug is delivered through the body so that it still can be an effective antifungal, but it's not, is renally damaging or renally eliminated even. And that's helped uh, the drug actually have some utility now. Azole antifungals, uh, the ones you're gonna be most common with uh, from a broad practice standpoint. So pretty much anyone who practices anywhere in medicine will have some aspect of azole antifungal. In fact, a lot of these topical preparations are available over the counter. 
The spectrum of activity is quite broad with these, so sometimes they're really narrow. They only cover maybe just one species of candida. Other ones can be quite helpful for more severe infections or more odd fungal infections. Um, one thing very important to remember, azel antifungals are major CYP enzyme inhibitors. So when we talk about cytochrome P450 enzyme manipulation and inhibitors, again, I said in the first set of lectures, a lot of times it's not clinically significant. These are ones that can cause clinically significant interactions. They're very potent CYP inhibitors, so they will cause serum concentrations of anything that's CYP metabolized to increase substantially. So if you give these with somebody, it comes into play, actually, if you think about some of the populations that are at risk for fungal infections. So people undergoing chemotherapy, HIV patients, and um, uh, immunocompromised patients, so like solid organ transplant. All those patients have one, well, they have probably multiple things in common. But one thing that I think that they have in common is they're on complicated drug regimens that are crucial to their survival. So you can't monkey with them too much, or you could end up with systemic toxicity or other issues. So it is something we look at really carefully. So just keep in mind that if you remember one major issue with azoles as a class is that cytochrome P450 inhibition. Uh, generally, we avoid them in pregnancy, but you can give small doses of certain ones, and I'll talk about that in a second. Topical things, usually it's fine during pregnancy. You aren't going to absorb enough of it systemically for it to matter. We'll talk about that more during derm, but just for the record. Um, ketoconazole is a topical agent for the most part. You'll see it used for uh, mostly topical candida infections. Technically, you could use it orally for some other things, but it's rarely used for that. Uh, fluconazole or diflucan is going to be the most common commonly used basic candida inf anti-infective agent that you'll come across. It's a one-time dose for vaginal yeast infections. And remember when I said these usually aren't used in pregnancy? Well, even though fluconazole isn't recommended in pregnancy long-term for like, you know, repeated doses, for a one-time dose, it's thought to be relatively safe. So you could use this as an oral option for somebody. And it's much more effective to give for vaginal yeast infection versus doing repeated doses of like a topical preparation. Anyway, candida albicans is the primary target here, which is the thing that, which is the bug that's going to cause thrush and other common infections. Um, candida glabrata or cruci are other more advanced uh, candida species that can cause more significant or serious infections, I should say. And fluconazole, it's not that it's not effective for those. It actually can be sometimes, but it's generally resistant, so we don't use it empirically. It does have a long half-life. It's got about 30 hours. It's available IV and PO. So for a more severe infection, you could use it IV and then convert somebody to a PO therapy. It has really good central nervous system in penetration. So if you do have a candida-related meningitis or something like that that's sensitive to fluconazole, it's a great drug for that. In fact, this is still, even though we commonly use it for these basic infections, for as a first-line agent for adding on antifungal coverage to a complicated antimicrobial regimen for a sick patient, they still do use fluconazole quite a bit just because it is um, highly effective for candida albicans, which is still a pretty common yeast that's found in some of the more serious infections too. These, while problematic, are a little bit more rare. Itraconazole, uh, PO only, there's some other uses for it. I, I, I'm not really concerned you know much about it. It's not very commonly used. Voriconazole is, uh, I think of it like fluconazole's bigger brother. So if you have a significant, serious fungal infection that you need to treat more aggressively, it's got a much more broad spectrum of activity. So it covers these resistant candida species like Glabrata and Crucii. It covers Aspergillus. It is available IV and PO, so you could treat you know, P, um, some sort of a, uh, infection orally if you wanted to convert somebody to that has some interesting side effects, causes vision changes. People might see halo effects or even mildly hallucinate. Posaconazole is another PO only drug. It covers some of these things. So we're, when we talk about these PO ones, so like posaconazole and itraconazole, I guess the, the question would be, what exactly are you trying to treat with it? There's situational uses for it that you can see here. Uh, somebody had some sort of an infection that they could qualify for PO. But the idea is you'd probably convert them to whatever you're treating IV with. So if you started them on something IV, but long term, maybe they're getting a lot of hallucinations on voriconazole, so it makes sense to switch them to something else. So just to talk about the utility of why these products exist, it's just they aren't very commonly used.
All right, moving on to kind of candens. Uh, these are the, I call them the fun fungin because they all end like that. So caspo, mica, and andula fungin. They're all kind of interchangeable. They're all really broad spectrum. They're well tolerated and they're all kind of expensive. So these are actually becoming more or less the go-to when it comes to a really sick patient who's admitted to the hospital, who might have a fungal infection on board, not responding to antibiotics is one of those candidate is a candidate based on one of the disease states we've talked about for possible fungal infection. So usually immunocompromised somehow. And these drugs are usually the first ones we add on. Uh, Caspo, mica, andula, again, they're all pretty much interchangeable. There's some drug interactions. I put these up. Don't worry about this for this test. We'll talk about tacrolimus, cyclosporin, serolimus, and some other of these drugs when we talk about transplant next module. But the point is, is that these do interact with transplant medications, and TAC is specifically a really popular one. So you might need to adjust your therapy based on this. But I will just give the, while I'm talking about this, I'll just say that these are going to be odd for the general prescriber to, to use. So even if you are a hospitalist type practitioner, or even if you're an intensivist, I don't know if you're going to be prescribing these a whole lot. A lot of times it's it's an IV consult that's what's bringing this in. And I so strongly suggest if you're ever thinking about prescribing an IV antifungal like this, you probably get ID on board. In fact, some institutions might restrict these to ID providers only, so they actually won't let anyone prescribe them unless you have certain credentials. Most of that's a cost control thing because we don't want people just to prescribe them for no reason. Uh, they are IV only, so there's not an oral alternative. Uh, and again, they're pretty well tolerated. Headache, GI tract issues, maybe sometimes infusion-related side effects. Um, drug interactions, again, they vary depending on, but for the most part, not significant enough for us to care. There's, again, some transplant-related issues, but other than that, not, not a big deal. Okay, some other things to talk about quickly. These are topical agents, clotrimazole, myconazole. These are mostly used for things like ringworm or quote-unquote jock itch, athlete's foot, etc. Those are mostly tinea infections, and tinea is a fungus. Uh, the tinea species, I should say, are fungus, fungi. And you can apply these. They come in sprays and all kinds of different creams. Um, Terbinafine is another one. There's another newer one, too, that's kind of like terbinafine. I can't remember the name of it. But anyway, they're, they're pretty much all similar, I think. If somebody does have a topical infection, recommend trying one of these. I don't think it matters which one. There's not good evidence to say clotrimazole is more effective than terbinafine. I would say try one. If things don't seem to improve after you know a few days of use or a week of use, maybe switch to another one. And if things don't improve after that, maybe think about something that is um, oral potentially. But for the most part, a lot of these infections are self-limiting. They'll go away over time. And the, uh, the topical agent can help move that process along. All right, so if you want to know what covers what, this is a nice chart that shows you the different drugs. So these are abbreviated. So we have uh, AM would be amphotericin B. Here are your azole antifungal, so fluconazole, itraconazole, boriconazole, etc. You can see what covers what here. Uh, the dotted line would mean sometimes covers, probably. You can see that, again, fluconazole drops off when you look at like the aspergillus type things. And as far as really broad spectrum, got posaconazole, our oral drug is actually quite broad spectrum, boriconazole. Econocandians don't cover these drugs, these bugs, but we generally aren't looking at these types of uh, fungal infections. When we talk about our, our most common severe infections, we're looking at more aspergillus versus some sort of an odd candida. And of course, if we got this, we could switch them to something else. But that's really all, all I want to talk about with that. Uh, side effects, so just if you want a nice summary slide to remember this, uh, really all I care about you knowing for this exam, uh, boriconazole's vision changes, amphotericin B's renal toxicity, and then knowing that the azole antifungals have some side effects, so this summarizes it nicely. I would know for sure that the azole antifungals do cause significant cytochrome P450 inhibition, so you're looking at drug interaction problems. Uh, and they put some cardiac QTC prolongation. Uh, one thing to think about, usually we don't care about this uh, prolonging the QTC interval if it's just like a one-time fluconazole dose or something like that. You, you really don't care. If it's somebody's on it sustained, and again, you're looking at drug interactions that are causing it to either be higher concentrations or whatever it might be, that could cause issues with 
uh, QTC prolongation. So something to keep in the back of your head. We'll talk a lot about QTC prolongations. I'm not going to get into it more right now. Some drugs cause it, some don't. Sometimes it's clinically relevant and sometimes it's not. Anyway, we'll get more into that later as we talk more about different drugs and different side effect profiles. All right, malaria. Uh, malaria is a really significant infection pretty much everywhere, but well, in, anywhere tropical or subtropical, right? We don't really see malaria in the U.S. unless somebody comes back with it from another country. Uh, 300 to 500 million new infections reported each year and about 1 to 2 million deaths per year. It's actually a really large cause of death worldwide. And there's a lot of different types of malaria too. And so uh, malaria has varying resistance patterns all throughout the world. Where this will come into play for your practice probably is if you have people traveling and they want to know what should I be on for prophylaxis. Uh, the CDC has a website, and I just took a little snapshot of it, uh, that shows you where somebody has. So let's say somebody calls and says, I'm going to go to American Samoa on vacation. Well, that sounds really nice. You can look at this and say, okay, there's no malaria there, and I don't have to treat you. So that's great. Maybe somebody says, hey, I'm in the military, and I'm going to Afghanistan. I'm guessing the military would take care of them for this, but let's just use this as a hypothetical scenario. And say uh, high risk here, um, drug resistance chloroquine. So you wouldn't prescribe chloroquine. Recommended chemoprophylaxis. So tovaquone, proguanol, which is malarone, which we'll talk about here in a second. Doxycycline, mefloquine. So it gives you some options there to try. And so anyway, you can plug in whatever country the patient's going to and say, okay, yep, that is recommended to prophylax, and here's a regimen we'll pick. So that can be pretty common for a primary care clinic, especially if you're um, working with anybody who travels at all, and lots of people like to go to warmer climates, so certainly uh, applicable to a lot of the population. Uh, here's just a malaria life cycle and everything like that. You've probably seen this in various classes because it's kind of an interesting discussion on production and cell biology and stuff like that, but I'm, I don't care that you know this. Obviously, mosquitoes do transfer it, and that's really the point there. So when we prevent this, um, regimens, when we're trying to use prophylaxis for traveling. Regimens vary in cost, side effects, and dosing schedule. So we want to take all those things into consideration. And again, the CDC chart is going to be your friend. Uh, 2009 study showed 90% of American travelers took an ineffective drug, took their drug inappropriately, or just didn't take it at all <laughs> when they went abroad. So making sure that people understand the importance of doing this. I think a lot of people just think, oh, what well, won't happen to me? And yeah, the, the the risk is pretty low, even if you didn't chemoprophylax at all, but malaria is not fun, and it's something that we should make sure we're treating appropriately. So our usually, usual strategy for dosing these, all the drugs are pretty much the same. We're going to take them for some duration prior to travel. You're going to take them during your travel and for a period of time following departure or return to your home country or state, wherever that may be. All right, so... Keep that in mind when we talk about some of these drugs. Uh, malarone or atovacone proguanol is the most commonly used one out there. That There's some really nice advantages to it. First of all, it's a really easy regimen. You only take it one to two days before. Uh, you take it every day during and seven days following. So it's a once daily regimen. I should probably put that on there. So it's Q-day, which I honestly think is more advantageous than something that's Q-week because it's easier to remember to take it once every day versus every week. There's actually studies that show that, by the way. Weekly regimens can be really hard for people to adhere to because they just forget. They're like, oh, did I take that on Monday or did I take that on Tuesday? When did I take that? And eh, I'll just skip it. <laughs> then, then you become one of the 90% statistic, right? Uh, it's really well tolerated for the most part. GI side effects are the biggest thing, which can be mitigated by taking it with food. Uh, generally speaking, for people who take this, they, they tolerate it quite well. And again, because of the short duration and only a week after, it's a popular option. The other nice thing, and I'll just add a little bullet point here, oops, is low resistance. It's pretty well, um, not well, well, it's well tolerated, but it's got decent resistant pattern worldwide, so you aren't going to run into a lot of countries that don't recommend malaron. Mefloquin or larium is taken once weekly. You start two to three weeks before and four weeks after. So after you get home from your tropical vacation, you have to remember to take this for four whole weeks, once each week. You know, again, the 90% statistic makes a little bit more sense when you read about stuff like this. Uh, side effects are, are pretty all over the place. GI upset um, to um, some interesting psychiatric related side effects. So this is one of the drugs that has a bit of a unique side effect profile. Anxiety, depression, nightmares, paranoid ideation, almost like a mild schizophrenic episode. 
more common in women who take it. And if you are going to recommend this to somebody, I would actually probably start a few weeks earlier than the recommended. So as opposed to two to three, four, three weeks, maybe have them start four weeks before. Just make sure that the person isn't having any of these psychiatric related symptoms prior to their travel. Certainly you don't want them to feel paranoid or depressed or whatever it might be. People with a history of major mental health disorders, I'd probably say avoid this altogether. Now, some questions, sometimes you might have to. For example, this one's actually safe in pregnancy for Malarone. Not recommended in pregnant patients. Uh, so when you're looking at which to pick, that could actually come into play pretty significantly if your patient's pregnant. Or also if the CDC says we recommend mefloquine here because other things are resistant, that'd be another case where you try this actually first line. But again, the regimen's confusing. The side effects are significant. This is not a first line option for most people if you can avoid it. Doxycycline. Uh, we talked about doxy as an antibiotic. The regimen is one to two days before. It's once daily or twice daily. It's twice daily. Yeah, BID. BID dosing. One to two days before, four weeks following. So again, you're taking this twice daily for four weeks afterwards. Doxycycline is kind of a broad spectrum antibiotic. You probably aren't doing your GI tract any favors with that. Long regimen. And again, for four weeks following, most people aren't going to finish that. Um, usually well tolerated for the most part, but again, GI upset. And then this sun sensitivity. Uh, anytime you're thinking about sending somebody to a subtropical area and giving them a drug that causes sun sensitivity, so basically photosensitivity or increased risk of phototoxicity, meaning that you're going to burn easier. Some of our drugs do do that, and so that's something to consider, especially for these particular things, because you aren't going to send somebody to you know, northern Canada in the middle of, I don't know, winter <laughs> when they... Uh, when they need malaria drugs, right? So this is going to be somebody going to a warm part of the country, sunny, uh, definitely come into play. And it is contraindicated in pregnancy in children less than eight years old. Chloroquine uh, or Arlen is a once weekly, start one week before, four weeks after, usually well tolerated. However, it has very high resistance rates. High resistance. It is safe in pregnancy though you do have this weird regimen. So um, some disadvantages to it. Primaquin, pretty easy, one to two days before, seven days following, may cause hemolytic anemia and GI upset, contraindicated in pregnancy and breastfeeding. It's it's not preferred compared to malarone, uh, but it does have a similar regimen to ralamone, uh, malarone. Excuse me. Uh, active infections, we don't see this a lot here. If you do go to practice medicine or do medical missions or anything like that in a tropical part of the world, you'll see this more commonly. However, we just don't use medications like this a lot in the United States. And there's other ones like this. We had a person at, at Abbott actually within the last year who I had to coordinate with the CDC to get a special drop shipment of medication for, I think I mentioned this earlier, uh, but it was sort of an interesting story that we just don't stock malarone or uh, malarone, malaria drugs. And because we don't use them, they're expensive. Some of them are investigational. Some of them don't have full FDA approval. Um, anyway, the CDC has a, uh, I guess, I don't know if you call them clusters or stockpiles or whatever, strategically positioned throughout the country. So I had to coordinate with Chicago to get one of these medications sent up. And it was a little bit of an interesting experience. But again, if you do have something on this, it's going to be an IV, an ID specialist. I should say IV dosing, IV specialist, and you're going to have to go through the CDC, unless you, again, are practicing somewhere where this is commonly used. Parasitic infection is going to blow through this stuff. It's just uh, not really going to be relevant to testing. Uh, Giardia lambli lambi lamblia, I think I spelled that wrong, maybe not. Uh, most common diarrhea-related parasite worldwide, uh, fecal oral contam fecally contaminated food or water. Symptoms include diarrhea. Uh, treatment of choice is usually metronidazole, so we use an antibiotic, uh, metronidazole, to treat this. Um, helminthic infections, aka worms of various sorts, not super common in the United States, uh, but do infect a large number of humans worldwide. Again, if you do tropical medicine or work in some developing countries, you might see this more commonly. Um, there's a number of different types of worms. They usually get in through the skin somehow or through the GI tract, one of the two ways. 
uh, mabendazole or ivermectin are two of them that can work for these. Uh, flukes, uh, which we actually might see more in, in Minnesota. Schistosoma, probably not common, but uh, or swimmer's itch, sorry. Schistosoma, swimmer's itch. Um, treatment is praziquantel. Uh, I, I don't know if you're going to ever see cases bad enough where you actually have to use it, but it's possible. Tapeworms, uh, this is going to be a lot less common in a developed country just because our food undergoes more significant testing. So to get this into somebody's food supply is going to be substantially difficult, I think. But anyway, it's possible. Um, undercooked meats, so beef, pork, uh, many infections end up being subclinical. However, pork tapeworms can move to muscles and actually have been found to have neurological neurologic involvement at some point. Usually it's associated with pig waste contaminated in human drinking water versus actually undercooked pork or contaminated beef. Because again, the food is usually, or the, the actual end products that we're buying out of a grocery store or whatnot are, are tested. They have to undergo certain inspections and things like that. Whereas, the, of course, if something gets contaminated in, in a waste or in a water stream, that can be more difficult to catch. Treatment, uh, albendazole and praziquantel are the two. So if you remember, basically, praziquantel and then mebendazole and albendazole, those are really the three drugs to think about. So if I ask you kind of a general question about tapeworms or, or whatever, just if you know those three, you'll, and you can recognize that they're used in this area of medicine, you'll be okay. I'm not going to ask you specifically what to treat which tapeworm with. I don't think it's that common or comes up that often where it's really that important that I make you memorize that. So just so that you know that there are treatment options for this, but again, it's, it's pretty rare. Uh, unless some of you, some of you might want to do this, but um, if anyone does go abroad to do medicine, you see this more often, but in Minnesota, it's just not super common. So that's it. Uh, antifungals, again, not a huge part of the exam. So you're probably getting this already, but the majority of the exam is focused on antibiotics because that's going to be the most common thing we all see. Focus on a couple of things I highlighted from this lecture, but uh, not a lot of questions are going to be based off of this material. Just a lot of it's drugs. It exists. It's important in certain aspects of medicine, but it's so specialized and niche that it's really not worth us spending any more time than we already did. So with that being said, I will see you guys next week, and we'll talk about some more um, antibiotics in depth, and we'll do some review. Thanks.